Well, news from the tech front tonight. Amazon has announced, after months of hype, that it's building two new headquarter facilities, one outside New York City and the other outside Washington in Arlington, Virginia. In return for bestowing his grace on America's two richest cities, Jeff Bezos, who is the world's richest man, will receive more than $2 billion in subsidies from you, the taxpayer. Well, new Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had this to say today, quote, Amazon is a billion dollar company. The idea that it will receive hundreds of millions of dollars in tax breaks at a time when our subway is crumbling and our communities need more investment, not less, is extremely concerning to residents here. Hate to admit it, but Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has a very good point. Brian Brenberg is associate professor of business and economics at the King's College, and he joins us tonight. Professor, thank you very much for coming on. That's the only time I've ever agreed with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, <laughs> but it's hard to argue with the internal logic of her point. The richest man in the world just got $2 billion in taxpayer subsidies? Well, How does that work? And Can I ask you a question as an American? I should just say, I'm a property owner in the District of Columbia. This makes my property values go up. I guess it's good for me. But having lived here for a long time, I can tell you the last thing we need is more money in Washington. It's rich enough. Why wouldn't Amazon, subsidized by taxpayers, spread the wealth maybe to Detroit or Cleveland or Toledo or someplace that actually needs it? I don't well, understand. It, it because Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, is worth about $150 billion. That's enough to make him the richest man in the world by far and possibly the richest human being in all of human history. It's certainly enough to pay his employees well. But he doesn't. A huge number of Amazon workers are so poorly paid, they qualify for federal welfare benefits. According to data from the nonprofit group New Food Economy, nearly one in three Amazon employees in Arizona, for example, was on food stamps last year. Jeff Bezos isn't paying his workers enough to eat, so you made up the difference with your tax dollars. Next time you see Jeff Bezos, make certain that he says thank you. What about the Walton family? They founded Walmart. Collectively, they're worth about $175 billion. That's more than the entire gross domestic product of Qatar, the oil-rich Gulf state. The Waltons could certainly afford to be generous with their workers. Instead, they count on you to take up the slack. In 2013, taxpayers sent more than $6 billion to Walmart's employees for food stamps, Medicaid, and housing assistance. And if you think that's remarkable, meet Travis Kalanick. He's the youthful founder of Uber. His personal fortune is close to $5 billion. His drivers, by contrast, often make less than minimum wage. One recent study found that many Uber drivers lose money working for the company. That's not a sustainable business model. The only reason it continues is because of your generosity. Because you're paying the welfare benefits for Uber's impoverished drivers, child billionaires like Travis get to keep buying bigger houses and more airplanes. He's someone else who owes you a thank you note. If you can think of a less fair system than this, send us an email. We'd love to hear about it. This system is indefensible. And yet, almost nobody ever complains about it. How come? There is one person in Washington who is offended by this arrangement, and we're sorry to say he's wrong on pretty much everything else. But this is a weird moment in American politics, so you take allies where you can find them. Bernie Sanders, of all people, is trying to get your money back from Jeff Bezos. This is especially amazing since Bezos is on Bernie's side on most things. They're both left-wing activists. But on this question, Bernie is right. He's planning legislation that would force big corporations to return the taxpayer-funded welfare benefits you have paid to their workers. It's not a perfect solution, and it's unlikely to pass. Anyone who thinks the health of a nation can be summed up in GDP is an idiot. The goal for America is both simpler and more elusive than mere prosperity. It's happiness. There are a lot of ingredients in being happy. Dignity, purpose, self-control, independence, above all, deep relationships with other people. Those are the things that you want for your children. They're what our leaders should want for us and would want if they cared. But our leaders don't care. We are ruled by mercenaries who feel no long-term obligation to the people they rule. They're day traders, substitute teachers. They're just passing through. They have no skin in this game, and it shows. They can't solve our problems. They don't even bother to understand our problems. One of the biggest lies our leaders tell us is that you can separate economics from everything else that matters. Economics is a topic for public debate. Family and faith and culture, meanwhile, those are personal matters. Both parties believe this. Social conservatives, meanwhile, 
come to the debate from the opposite perspective and yet reach a strikingly similar conclusion. The real problem, you'll hear them say, is that the American family is collapsing. Nothing can be fixed before we fix that. Yet, like the libertarians they claim to oppose, many social conservatives also consider markets sacrosanct. The idea that families are being crushed by market forces never seems to occur to them. They refuse to consider it. Questioning markets feels like apostasy. Both sides in this miss the obvious point. Culture and, and economics are inseparably intertwined. Certain economic systems allow families to thrive. Thriving families make market economies possible. You cannot separate the two. For our ruling class, more investment banking is almost always the answer. They teach us it's more virtuous to devote your life to some soulless corporation than it is to raise your own kids. Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook wrote an entire book about this. Sandberg explained that our first duty is to shareholders above our own children. Her book became a bestseller, Lean In, as if putting a corporation first is empowerment. It is not. It is bondage. And Republicans should say so. They should also speak out against the ugliest parts of our financial system. Not all commerce is good. Why is it defensible to loan people money they can't possibly repay or charge them interest that impoverishes them? Payday loan outlets in poor neighborhoods collect 400 percent annual interest. Are we OK with that? We should not be. Libertarians tell us that's how markets work, consenting adults making voluntary decisions about how to live their lives. OK, but it's also disgusting. If you care about America, you ought to oppose the exploitation of Americans, whether it's happening in the inner city or on Wall Street. When you care about people, you do your best to treat them fairly. Our leaders don't even try. They hand out jobs and contracts and scholarships and slots at prestigious universities based purely on how we look. There's nothing less fair than that, though our tax code does come close. Under our current system, an American who works for a salary pays about twice the tax rate of someone who's living off inherited money. It doesn't work at all. We tax capital at half the rate we tax labor. It's a sweet deal if you work in finance, as many of our richest people do. In 2010, for example, Mitt Romney made about $22 million in investment income. He paid an effective federal tax rate of 14 percent. For normal upper middle class wage earners, the federal tax rate is nearly 40 percent. No wonder Mitt Romney supports the status quo. But for everyone else, it's infuriating. Our leaders rarely mention any of this. They tell us our multi-tiered tax code is based on the principles of the free market. Please. It's based on laws that the Congress passed, laws that companies lobbied for in order to increase their economic advantage. And it worked well for those people. They did increase their economic advantage. But for everyone else, there was a big cost. Unfairness is profoundly divisive. Divided countries are easier to rule. And nothing divides us like the perception that some people are getting special treatment. In our country, some people definitely are getting special treatment. Republicans should oppose that with everything they have. So the question is, what kind of country do you want to live in? Well, a fair country. A decent country, a cohesive country, a country. What will it take to get a country like that? Leaders who want it. For now, those leaders will have to be Republicans. There's no option at this point. But first, Republican leaders will have to acknowledge that market capitalism is not a religion. Market capitalism is a tool, like a staple gun or a toaster. You'd have to be a fool to worship it. Our system was created by human beings for the benefit of human beings. We do not exist to serve markets, just the opposite. Any economic system that weakens and destroys families is not worth having. A system like that is the enemy of a healthy society. Internalizing all this will not be easy for Republican leaders. They'll have to unlearn decades of bumper sticker talking points and corporate propaganda. They'll likely lose donors in the process. They'll be criticized.